Thank you all for coming. I mean, what a great topic. Beer, bees, you know, how can you go wrong? Um, so I'd like to talk for maybe 30 minutes, and then if you have any questions, do it then rather than stopping in the middle. It's a little, the flow is better, I think, and um, I think, anyway, I'd rather do it that way. So you don't get a choice. Um, so, um, we all start, well, not we all, but at least I started drinking in high school, like most people. And, um, <clears throat> uh, but I also got a chance on an incredible uh, tour of the Far East uh, when I was in college, where um, we, we sang 35 concerts in 60 days in seven countries. And uh, up on the left-hand corner is me showing other members of our group how to drink. Uh, and uh, great Japanese beer. Uh, continuing this, same place, different beer, um, and uh, well, um, fast forward to 1971, when my wife and I moved to um, Vermont and moved to St. Johnsbury, and um, I had gotten um, interested in uh, traveling in Scotland in the bagpipes, and I was looking around for someone who could teach me at least, you know, elementary bagpiping. And there was a guy in uh, Thetford, no, not Thetford, he was in, anyway, right next to Queechy, I think, <coughs> named Scott Hastings. And I went down to meet him, and uh, so he was showing me the bagpipes and showing me what to do and so forth. But when I looked in the kitchen, his wife was ultimately deciding she was making homebrew. I thought, boy, that's a pretty cool hobby. Um, so I, so that, that became, in the next six months, I was into three hobbies, which one was bees, one was beer, and one was the bagpipes. Well, I never got very good in the bagpipes, which is all right. So this is the last time you'll have, but it, it still shows where this hobby starts. And you, know, you have to take advantage of your opportunities. Um, now, uh, the Oxford, um, Universal Dictionary defines a hobby as an activity to which, in the observer's eyes, a person is unduly attached. <laughs> so I was never able to be really good in any of these things, but I kept at it, except for the bagpipes. And, uh, you know, it was really a struggle to be, aspire to be better than mediocre. Um, I had a great tutor in beekeeping, and that, and I got to be pretty good in that. Um, but the, um, the beer was, was, was tougher because um, there really wasn't, back then, home brewing was illegal. Um, and so when you did it, it wasn't as if you were dealing dope, but you still didn't have the availability of good ingredients. And so my first two or three batches were made with a blue ribbon hopped malt and Fleischmann's beer ye uh, bread yeast. And uh, you had to put it in a plastic bucket and wait till it uh, uh, cooked off. Or as one uh, recipe said, uh, you skim off the, fr the, fro the, 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 the skim off the, the, uh, the, the froth and the flies. And then you bottle it. Well, the first batch, or the first two batches, uh, I bottled. I put them in the basement. And after about 10 days, you start, they started to blow. And so this is... Uh, Jeff Danzer's drawing of, of me taking one case of this beer out of the basement to go put it on the, on the grass and let it uh, cook off. Um, well, um, you know, beer and, and uh, I did get better. And beer uh, and, and, and honey, let's see, um, you know, it really became great um, social lubricant because you could go to a party and you could take beer and if people didn't like beer you could take them honey or you could take them honey and if they didn't like the honey you could take them beer and eventually uh, people they drank it they didn't pour it into the ferns uh, and uh, and and then at the, at, at the other side of the supply the equation uh, equipment and ingredients became more available and better, um, really of higher quality. 
And this began really with um, uh, equipment and stuff from England, not from the United States, in the middle 70s. And I remember going out to Northampton, Mass, to a home brewing store to buy uh, malts and hops and, and yeast and to make an improved um, cases. Two, usually the, 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 the size, you'd make two cases of beer. And then depending upon how much you could get rid of or how much you drink yourself, then you make sort of once a, once a month. Um, and this is a, a modern, it's just gone out of business, but it, for 20 years it, they sold homebrew store, homebrew equipment in Winooski. And this is the kind of store that I found in Northampton and, and, in, other, and in other places. And it really led to a, a, a modest improvement in the quality. Well, it was actually a significant improvement in the quality because the ingredients were better, the recipes were better, and in the late 70s, a new uh, supply uh, or new um, industry of home brewing supplies began uh, to develop in Washington State, and Oregon, Colorado. Um, uh, just a, you know, I won't. Basically, what beer is, at least by the Germans, Reinheitsgebot, it is, is hops, water, yeast, and malt. And the process is the malt is first is malted and then it's put in a cooker at around 160 degrees and the fermentable sugars are extracted from that. That liquid is filtered, then it's put into a boil and boiled, of course, at 212 degrees with hops. And then it's cooled after 60 minutes, 90 minutes. The yeast is added and then it ferments in tanks for varying lengths of time. And, uh, so I, I like to say that the brewer is acting as a, um, a priest in overseeing the marriage of the bitter hops and the sweet wort to make the beer that we all love, or at least most of us love. Okay. Um, um, <clears throat> so out in, in California and in Oregon, uh, but particularly in California, the, uh, the American craft beer begins with really two people. It begins with Fritz Maytag, who was the heir of the Maytag uh, washing machine fortune. He bought a brewery called Anchor Steam in, in, uh, Wash in uh, San Francisco. And then at the other end of the economic spectrum, a, an ex-Navy man named Jack McAuliffe, who had learned to drink uh, English beers when he was in the submarine service in England, he retired and set up this little, first little brewery in uh, Sonoma, California, in an old chicken coop. And it was the first real craft brewer, uh, beer in the United States, well, certainly since Prohibition. And um, this bottle <coughs> I got from him when I, um, well, I'm getting a little ahead of the game, but, um, I'll show you, actually, I'll show you the, this, um, so th these are, except for me, uh, these are real pioneers in the craft brewing history. Uh, up in the upper uh, left is um, Michael Lewis, who taught brewing science at UC Davis. The guy sitting in the, in the wheelchair is Jack McAuliffe. Uh, uh, Charlie Papazian, really the founder of the American home brewing movement. Uh, and then behind him is Fritz Maytag and then uh, Ken Grossman, one of the founders of Sierra Nevada, uh, me, and then the woman, is the, she was the curator of beer at the Smithsonian. So they had this big deal, and, uh, and uh, I gave them this bottle. So if you go to the Smithsonian, you see this bottle uh, donated by Bill Mayers. So my claim to fame. <clears throat> um, Now, just another one of these early guys, Bill Owen, who's a terrific photographer, but he also liked to make beer, and he now is in the distilling business. Uh, but he had this little book where he said, you can make beer, you can build a brewery in 10 days. It'll cost you, I don't know, 500 bucks or something like that. But his, his most famous for this alimony ale, and, and the subscript said, the bitterest brew you'll ever make. Um, but he's a really interesting guy, too. So um, 
I got really interested, uh, my, my publisher, I was writing another book in, uh, with a publisher in New York, and, the, and I took a, used to take a couple of bottles of my beer down to him in New York, and um, I'd expatiate about how great home brewing was and how there was this beginning movement of, of craft brewing around the country, and he said, why don't you go and write a book about it? So I said, mm, all right. So off I went to uh, California and Oregon State, and uh, Colorado, and uh, England, went to England, and visited breweries, and talked to home brewers, uh, and ended up in 1984 and wrote this book. And uh, the, um, the subtitle was, um, you know, how to make these beers, but, and also how to resist the temptation to, to make your own brewery. Because at that time there were eight or 10 microbreweries in the country, 1984. Uh, and I used to get calls from people around the country saying, I've read your book, how do I do a brewery? I said, didn't you read the, the final chapter in the book was home to home brew. You know, I don't want to do this. It was really expensive. And I want to do other things in my life. So a lot of people said, heck, I'm not going to take your advice. And 10 years later, we decided to do another version of the book. And there, by that time, there were 600 microbreweries in the country. So a lot of people said I was wrong. Uh, um, so um, this was the second version, but it's still the same subheadings. You know how to how to resist the temptation to start your own brewery. Well, plenty of people just went ahead, and some of them were in 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 uh, Vermont. Uh, and then by that time, I was um, um, what was I doing? I was in the legislature, and um, a guy from Massachusetts, Greg Noonan, uh, came to Vermont. He, he, he had tried to set up a brew pub in Massachusetts, and the hoops he had to go through were too complicated. So he came to Vermont. Several people told him about me and, um, and also that I was in the legislature. So what he found was he had to change the law in order to permit brew pubs. Um, and in essence, the, under the post-prohibition law in Vermont, and a lot of states, manufacturers could not sell retail. And so what we had to do was change the liquor control law to allow, to call them manufacturers, to have a, um, a retail license. I don't know, I can't remember if it was class B or class C. But in effect, for the brewer to sell on premise. And so it took two years, but uh, Madeline uh, signed it. And then I got to cut the ribbon when they opened in November of 88. And uh, it was my you know, one great bit of brewing fame. Uh, and, uh, but it was great. It was, a, it was a third brew pub on the East Coast. Uh, and uh, now I'm guessing they're 10, 15 brew pubs in the state. Or there are even more if you define it. If you look at some place like Burlington Beer Company down there on Flynn Avenue, I mean, it's, it's a big brewery, but it's also a restaurant and it's got uh, selling beer. So it's, you could also call it a brew pub. Um, so um, that, was, uh, that was pretty satisfying. Uh, and uh, so uh, the next stage of, let's see. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is foam down on the waterfront. This is a, a mo I mean, I say modern, uh, but an even more successful, arguably, uh, brew pub than, um, because in, in, the, in the, the pub and brewery, the brewery is all down in the basement. This is all right. I mean, you can stand right next to the brewers as they're making this beer. Um, so these guys um, did a book about uh, brewers in Vermont, in, first in the 19, oh, around 2000, I guess. Uh, and um, I was going <clears> to <throat> show you uh, a few of the, the famous uh, people in Vermont and uh, give you a sense of the Vermont brewing scene. Uh, this is their book which uh, keeps going out of, out of print, I mean, or out of uh, date, because 
brewers keep coming onto the scene, but it still is a, it's a good book. And he's also, those also, I'm sorry, they've also done a book about Burlington beer, about the seven or eight or nine breweries in Burlington. Uh, this was the first uh, Vermont craft beer, uh, Catamount, down in White River Junction. And uh, they, they had a good early life, and uh, then they got overextended and um, maybe built too large, and then now they're a part of, I think, Harpoon. Uh, uh, Otter Creek, uh, started by a college graduate, graduate from Reed College in Oregon, uh, had a good successful life, and they've been swallowed up by somebody else. I can't remember. Uh, this is one of the craziest brewers in Vermont, uh, Ray McNeil, started off as a cellist and then decided what well, he wanted to make beer. And he makes some wonderful beer, but he never could get enough money to really keep the thing going. So all he could do is make great beers for his, his brew pub in Brattleboro. Um, Long Trail, successful uh, in Bridgewater, uh, one of those early brewers. Uh, this is just picture of, if anyone knows how hops are grown, they're grown on these great, and this is a very, these are really good hops that, that Vermont brewers used to have to buy most of their hops from the West, from um, Washington State and Oregon, but now there are a couple of really good hops farms in, in the state of Vermont. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. Uh, so in 2004, th 14, this, this is the crowd, the afternoon crowd on their way to Lawson's tent so they can get beers in the, at the Brewers Festival. Okay, and, uh, uh, and the guy on the right, Todd, I'm gonna have more to say about him, but Alan Newman was one of the founders of um, Magic Hat. And uh, he, has a, he had a great phrase about Magic Hat being, let's see if I can, uh, what does he say? Uh, well, maybe I can find it later. Uh, but anyway, he, he and a guy named Bob Johnson founded uh, Magic Hat, and they brought in Todd in the 1998 to be the uh, first of regular brewer and then head brewer, and when he came, Magic Hat was making 7,000 barrels of beer a year, and when he left, uh, 11 years later, they're making 180,000. Um, and then they got swallowed up by another brewery. Uh, uh, Sean Hill of Hill Farmstead, um, we all know about his uh, good beers, which he sells there in Greensboro um, to long lines of people from away. Uh, the Kimmiches, uh, very successful alchemist with uh, that and Focal Banger and, and Sean and Karen Lawson. Uh, you know, so there, I mean, you think these, these three brewers, brewers families too, that really have national reputation, really have, have had an effect on the, um, the brewing scene in the United States. And, and uh, someone said to, there's a great, great quote from, Sean Lawson says, any town with more than one restaurant can support a brew pub. Uh, and he's advertised his beer as a solar flare in liquid form. And, and the Kimmiches, um, uh, people have said, or have asked, you know, well, what's the, what's the Vermont style of beer? And, uh, John Kimmich says, he says, that's, that's too snooty. He says, it did become a, this is a, a observer saying it became a cold beer with people driving hundreds of miles for it. And they gushed about a Vermont style IPA. But Kimmich says, personally, I find it a little arrogant to try to claim we do something so different that it deserves its own category. Um, so this guy, um, is uh, he, he, he runs um, Drop-In Brewery in Middlebury, and he runs also the American Brewers Guild, one of the sort of second tier beer. If you want to study brewing science and being a brewer, you can go there. Uh, there's Siebel Institute in Chicago. And uh, he, 
he has won uh, the, the industry's highest award for it. He and Greg Noonan are the two people from Vermont who've won this uh, Russell Shearer Award. But he has a, a quote. He says, beer should not travel more in a day than a team of dray horses can pull a delivery wagon. So you want to drink, you want to produce and drink fresh, fresh beer. Um, so uh, going back, Todd, Todd Hare and I, um, we, we uh, actually got to know each other because of, of uh, beekeeping. He was a beekeeper and, and it was keeping bees in Heinsberg and I was keeping bees in Burlington. And so we decided we would combine our hives and put them behind the Magic Hat Brewery down on um, Bartlett's Bay uh, Road in South Burlington. So we did this for two or three years and um, so got to know him and I got to think he was really a pretty, pretty cool guy. And then at that Brewers Festival in uh, 2014, he came up to me and said, look, you got to another, do another edition of that book. Because think of all the breweries. There were, by that time, there were 3,500 or 4,000 breweries in the country. And I said, well, I'd only do that if you would do it with me. So off we started, arrogance just, just dripping from every pore. And after a couple months, we, this, is, this is stupid. We're, we're not going to do this. We don't know enough. We're not going to travel all that much. Um, but we will. It gave us an excuse to go to Oregon. So we went to Oregon to look at breweries. Um, and Oregon and Vermont go back and forth every year. Who's got the most breweries per capita? And sometimes it's, it's Vermont, sometimes it's Oregon. Uh, Oregon's got six times the population of Vermont. Um, but we decided we'd go and see how many breweries we could do in 12 days, and we did 22 breweries. Uh, and this happened to be one of them. This is from a, a family, the McMinimum brothers, who buy up old public buildings and turn them into hotels and, and breweries. And this is just one of their fermenting kettle, uh, 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 um, kettles, which they paint in this particular place in this old elementary school. So he said, well, that's not the model we want. And uh, so then at the other end of the scale, this is Deschutes, which at that time was producing about 300,000 barrels of beer a year. Um, and uh, he said, well, no, that's, that's too big for us. And then a lot of stuff in between. Uh, uh, but the one that really intrigued us was this uh, one in Bend, Oregon, which was called the Ale Apothecary. And this guy um, was the third generation of pharmacists, which is why he called it Ale Apothecary. But he made these very small batches of Belgian-style beer. And the Be Belgian beer is made with a whole different yeast from ales and lagers and uh, but you you make up these batches or you buy the wort you put them in the barrels with that yeast and you let them sit for a year year and a half sometimes two years and then you bottle it and it's it's a di whole different taste uh, we 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 decided but we thought well this is this is something we might do because you could buy the you didn't have to have a all the boiling vessels if you could Put the, you could buy the wort from another brewery and put it in tanks, put it in, the, put it in these barrels and let it sit uh, and then sell these bottles. We sold them in 500 milliliter, uh, um, even 750 milliliter bottles at an exorbitant price. I mean, we didn't tell people it was exorbitant, but it was um, because it was really good. And also you, you're paying for all that time in the barrel. And, um, but it was a different taste because we like to say there, you know, the three, three sips to enlightenment in drinking our beer. The first sip was, Jesus Christ, this stuff's taking the enamel off my teeth. And then the second sip is, holy moly, that's got a lot of different flavors in it. And the third sip is, where can I buy it? <laughs> well, you could buy it eventually. Well, eventually we, uh, well, we set up this, this is in a bay at Noise Tire on Pine Street. So we rented this, we brought the, the uh, uh, wart in, we bought wart from Zero Gravity from uh, Fiddlehead in these totes, 660 gallons. Then it went back into the bigger fermenters 
And after two weeks, then they went into the, these barrels, which eventually got all the way to the ceiling. And after four years, we ran out of space. And so then we moved down to Nordic uh, farms in uh, Charlotte. Uh, and then wrote, in effect, the third edition of this book. But it has, it's, it's half Todd and, and, and me, because he's the real brewer. You know, I'm the pretty face. And uh, it, it, was, it was fun to do. And I have copies here. And um, I'll sign them for $10. And you can have the book for free. Uh, so, uh, so that was really pretty exciting. And then we decided that we didn't work full, full time on this. So we sold it to Foam. And by that time, Todd was a partner in Foam. So he was just bringing another um, uh, cousin into the family. And I was happy to say farewell and go down and drink occasionally free beers at Foam. Uh, so this is my license plate. And, uh, and this is where our bottles were. And um, they all, uh, all had a dot. We started off with different color dots. And then we had added <clears throat> word dots, like serendipity dot, or uh, I can't remember some of the others. Because Todd liked to say, every great, all great art begins with a single dot. So this was great art. And, uh, and then we also would put in some of our honey. So we have it ended up coming back to this joint production of beer and, and, uh, and, be, and uh, bees. Um, so here's another two or, I can't remember, two or three, uh, different beers made with honey in Vermont. It's not all of them, but I just put them up there for that uh, thing. This is um, Burlington Beer Company. This is Kramer and Ken up in the islands. And uh, this is just a, it's a little out of date, probably, um, uh, Oh, well, it might be, I don't know, I mean, anyway, you get some sense of the, the industry of beer in Vermont. And there was a wonderful comment that Governor Scott made to the Brewers Association at their meeting three years ago. And he, he pointed to, he said, you look at a map like this, and you see that the industry is not concentrated in, this, in the cities. This is little breweries with two and three and four employees sprinkled around the whole uh, state, all of them adding to the local economy. And this is just a great thing to have. Uh, now, I, I, I don't think you can, you can see, I wish I could, if you look, how's the focus on that? Does that look like, is it in focus? Can you see it in focus, the map? Well, let's see. Right here, this is where uh, uh, Seven Days, Seven Days Building is. But that is also was the, the home of Peterson's Brewery from the 1860s to the time of Prohibition. Uh, it's the only brewery that I think, well, the only one I could ever find in Burlington. So this is a map from um, 18, late 1860s. Uh, so I know it takes a little more exegesis here to explain it, but I thought it was pretty cool. Peterson's Brewery, remember it. Um, let's see, what do we got here? A uh, couple more quotes. Uh, and. Um, Yeah, we, Todd liked to say, we're practicing the tactics of scarcity, not scare tactics as we make our beers. And, uh, and of course, you've all heard the old saw, give a man a beer and he'll waste an hour, teach him to make beer and he'll waste a lifetime. <laughs> uh, but this doesn't have to do with beer, except it's a great quote. This is William James, the American philosopher, who said, the union of the mathematician and the poet, fervor with measure, passion with correctness, that surely is the ideal. OK, I'll take some questions. I think, wait a minute, I got, I got actually me one more. Oh, yeah, here, OK, so this is the pub and brewery today. I mean, it's not a great picture, but anyway, that's, uh, then there's 
uh, Queen City. Uh, Paul Hale was a chemist at UVM, and uh, he and three partners started this, and this is his beer can collection down at uh, Queen City on Pine Street. Uh, and that's his old truck. You can't, I don't know if you can see the truck they put above the bar in this horseshoe-shaped bar there. Um, and uh, this is just telling you, you know, this is zero gravity uh, with hundreds and thousands of cans of their, their uh, signature beer, Conehead. Uh, Bill Cherry, the founder of uh, Switchback, uh, he bought these wonderful German uh, copper tanks. Uh, I think they were, they were done, made in the 50s, but he brought them over when he started the brewery. Um, Berlin Beer Company used to be was where the La Lumiere um, uh, movie company was located. Uh, and uh, this is not Swinooski, but, uh, um, oh, God, what's his, huh? Brian Acker. Brian Acker. A A Brian Ecker, yeah, yeah, uh, who um, used to keep, keep bees, uh, but he also worked at, I think he worked at uh, ben, Jerry's. ben and Jerry's. That's right. Now he's running this great brewery in Winooski. Okay, questions? This is one of my sons who works for Zero Gravity. Okay. <laughs> So now I ask questions or statements. No questions? Um, yeah. So I think I heard that Hermit Thrush is closing. Yep. Is that an indication that we're kind of reaching peak microbreweries, or is that just a, you know, they're, they're closing up shop for whatever reason? Uh, well, I think two things. Saturated? Well, I think I think there are two things going on. I mean, I, you know, I don't know their internal um, situation. Uh, I mean, of course, it happens in lots and lots of business. The overall, there has been an overall decline in craft beer, and I think indeed all beer sales, uh, as people are availed, can buy other things. I mean, here. I'm drinking, this is from zero gravity, but it has no sugar, nothing except some hops extract. And they call it hops fizz. And it's, it's selling well. Um, and so that's just appealing to someone who used to be stuck with, okay, well, I can get a light beer, or I can get a regular beer, or I can get a heavy duty beer. Um, I think there's just more choice out there. And so I think all, they used to have, I mean, there have been these peaks and valleys with beer over the, say, 40 years since they, they started, the, this craft beer movement started. And, uh, and there was a big pullback in the 90s. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and then it kept going. But I don't know how long it can go. I mean, can... Is, is, is uh, Lawson correct to say every town with two restaurants, one of them should be a brew pub? I, I don't know. Uh, because, I mean, just be, think about, you know, you know if you're going to do a, a brewery, you're in love with making beer. And, and you've got several major choices to make. So are you going to make an ale, ale slash porter slash stout? And those are made with top fermenting yeast. And the turnaround time is, say, two weeks before you can get it out into the customer's palate. If you make lagers, that's like a month or six weeks. And you've got to keep the medical colder. You've got to have refrigeration. And that's a different capital investment. Um, so that's one. And that's why most of the first 10 years of breweries in this country were, um, were ale based. They, were, they weren't lagers. They, the only lager brewery that started then that I visited anyway, was one in Montana. Um, and uh, I mean, the ratio was 20 to one. Now it's, you know, it's still as much more ales than, than lagers. But, um, that's, so that's one cho uh, choice. And then another choice is, do you do a brew pub? You say, well, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I want to do just beer. That means I got to go out and 
and find a distributor or do it myself or put in the put all the stuff on the shelves and and just sell this beer against 8,000 other beers that are out there or do I do a, a, a restaurant as well and have two streams of income um, well that means you have to have two sets of skills you got to have you know a brewer who's going to produce beers that aren't going to make people run for the hills uh, as well as a good chef uh, so you've got those demands on your dream of financial success uh, so it's that's why that's why I went home to home to home brew <laughs> yeah you know speaking of home brewing it was a real shame to see Annie and Matt White close up uh, you know, Vermont uh, home yeah supply. yeah uh, is there a place for that sort of business in, in Vermont any longer or where, where can we go to I don't know. I mean, if, if they can't, if they couldn't make it with their track record and with the breadth of stuff they offered, I don't know who else can do it unless, unless um, the shipping gets so good that you, you can get it all out of. Uh, um, I was trying to think the other day how I buy beekeeping supplies from several places. One is in Pennsylvania, one is in. Um, um, Greenwich, New York, um, and sometimes out in Minnesota. Um, but those are really big operations. I mean, it's not, doesn't make sense for, there actually is a, one, a woman who has a beekeeping supply store in Williamstown, Vermont. But she has to pay extra for the shipping that, because she's, she has to buy it from these bigger people. So then, for the convenience of you going to Williamstown instead of Greenwich, she's got to add X amount. I think it's, I think it's tough. <laughs> um, and then how many people want to continue to do home brewing when they can go and drink really wonderful beers in uh, public places? Right. I don't know. I don't have an answer. <laughs> Yeah. I have a question about Hetty Topper. Yeah. I've got, I've got a young, a young friend who comes from Connecticut, and, and uh, he, when he comes up, he wants me to find the store that's going to get the delivery of Hetty Topper on the day he's going to be here. Now, what is so special about Hetty Topper? Well, it's a cult beer. I mean, I think it's great, but you know, I don't think I would that I would do that, but I'm here, I'm living in Vermont, so I can, I can pick and choose. Uh, and I don't think they do it as much as they used to. It used to be that the beverage warehouse would have it from 11 to 1 o'clock on Saturdays. And, 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 but I think you can get it now. Anywhere, anywhere right? Okay. Yep. Uh, he also likes Lawson and that Edwards up in... Yeah, well, same thing, yeah. But there you have to travel up there. But that's another cult. You know, it's a pilgrimage. You know, in the Middle Ages, you know, they went to look for Christ. But, you know, here they go and look for beer. Yeah. Do you know if, the, where they, if or where they made beer um, during the uh, Prohibition in Burlington? Do you know anything about that? During Prohibition? Yeah. Well, what, I mean, Prohibition prohibited it. Illegal beer. Illegal. Oh, illegal beer. Yeah, illegal beer. Well. Illegal beer. I don't know. My father... <laughs> was a chemist uh, for Goodrich a Tire Company in the, in the 20s, and he had a, um, an apartment that happened to be over the um, residence of the sister of the sheriff of Akron County. And one time, their batch blew and came dripping down through the roof. And, <laughs> And the woman said, to my father, well, you get it all cleaned up. I'm not going to tell my brother. Uh, but that must have happened a lot. I mean, you know, people died of alcohol poisoning. I mean, it just, it, you know, it's. <laughs> and then, of course, they bootlegged it in from Canada. I mean, Vermonters were lucky because they were so close to Canada. 
in, in the early 1800s, or so before the big boom that we have right now, where, where were kind of the major microbreweries, you know, local breweries in, in Burlington? I, for example, I think I recall that there were breweries in the block, or a brewery in the block where Radio Bean is now. Um, Gosh. In what period? I mean, I, you know, in the I... early 1900s, late 1800s. I don't know. I've, I've, on these maps that I've been looking, it's the only, Peterson's is the only one I ever found in, in Burlington. Okay. Um, so was Peterson's the brewery that, um, the reason that it became illegal to brew and serve beer in Burlington was that down by the railroad tracks, they were brewing beer and they had so many rats that uh, they, they had to, that's what, that's why it became illegal to do the boat in, that was back in the 1800s, earlier, uh, 1850s. Huh, well I never heard that story, I mean, maybe true. Huh. But Greg Newman was a, a, a friend of mine and uh, I met him, he, he, he came in and he, I was selling music and he was buying a whole stack of music and I, I just looked at it and I said, what are you buying all this for? And he said, well, I am opened the pub and brewery. He hadn't opened it yet. It, yeah. He said, and uh, I said, you can't brew and sell in the same place. He goes, I got the law changed. <laughs> and, it, and that's what they put on that sign outside the thing. It's in bra uh, brass now, plate or whatever. Outside the door it says, I got the law changed. <laughs> yep. it's true. It's even, very interesting, yeah. 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 A little bit of a sideways question. So, Nordic Farms. Yeah. Uh, there were some really ambitious plans to develop uh, educational research and the proponent unfortunately died early. So what's going on up at Nordic Farms is, are you still doing bees up there? Or are there <clears throat> still being grown and developed or is it? I don't know, first of all. I mean, I, Todd, I mean, and, and since I no longer, no longer own part of foam, are part of House of Pharmatology. I don't know for sure, but he's going to move all of that equipment over to the brewery, the, the foam brewery in Heinsberg, um, because I think it's still up in the air as to <clears throat> whether there's a viable um, buyer for the even part of the property. Um, um, so, well, that's a whole different thing. That's a guy who, I mean, there were three businesses in that building. Uh, there was John Brawley doing shrimp and this person doing a, a bakery. And then we had a house of fermentology, which it, the equipment's still there, but it's going to be moved in the next two months. Um, but that'll only leave two tenants um, in this big, sprawling place. It may be a tragedy if, if it can't be developed in some way, but willing buyer and willing seller. Is the barley processing not going on there any longer? No. Really? No, that, that, that didn't... Um, well, they were trying uh, a whole new method of, of, produce, of uh, <clears throat> doing the barley, and the machinery just didn't work. Um, no. So another reason to be out of the beer, beer business. Well, then that brings up my question. Um, <laughs> you know, we've seen some you know, trends, you know, barrel aging beers. There was a whole time here when, it, when this all got going with the, uh, all the hazy big IPAs like Heady Topper. Um, now it's trending towards lagers, pilsners, really low ABV stuff. I wonder if you could just maybe Pull out your crystal ball and take a guess at like what might be the what the next what the next trend you know, might be. <laughs> God. 
<laughs> oh my <laughs> god. Uh, <laughs> well, I hate to <laughs> fall back on the old cliche is, is your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the background is, is people, more and more people realize that alcohol is not a good thing for you. I mean, here are the Canadians saying you shouldn't drink at all. Okay, and then at the, same, at the other end of the spectrum, you got plenty of other <laughs> illegal uh, enlightening substances that you can get uh, under the table and get your high or whatever you're going to do. And then you've got this extrusion of the ABB uh, offerings that go from traditional hard liquor on through wine to uh, beers of various. I mean, you know, think about this. I mean, who would have thought five years ago that you'd sell for $6 six uh, cans of this stuff, um, total fat content, zero, sodium, zero, total carbohydrates, zero, uh, something else, zero, I can't read. Uh, I mean, it's just water. I mean, it's seltzer. I mean, it's, it's sparkling water. Um, but they're doing it. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's as good as I can do. <laughs> what else? Well, just to follow up on that previous question, and there was a trend that seemed for a while of, of people adding just about any flavor you could imagine to, to beer. I think Four Quarters was a great example of that. And are, are we hopefully maybe moving away from that? Again? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I remember, I, well, I remember just just being incensed when, Ma when uh, Magic Hat introduced number nine with that apricot flavor. I thought that was just a sin against all, all humanity and good beer and so forth. But it, it ended up being 40% of their, of their sales. And I thought 40% of the people are stupid. I mean, they got no taste buds at all. But that did set, help to set this trend forever fruitier and you know, but that's a trend I didn't like. I mean, I, I'm not gonna get on a soapbox and say it's wrong, but it, I wouldn't buy fruited flavored beers. Um, but American hops are, are fruity tasting. Well, I think, if, I mean, foam uses as, as much or more New Zealand hops as American hops, and I mean, uh, so I don't... I, I don't mean where they're made, I meant they brew the whole new type of hops that they call American hops. Yeah, but they've always been American, for 150 years have been American hops. They, they brew hops, was the biggest industry in, in Vermont, it was a huge industry. This is a new strain of hops, they call American hops. Oh, okay. And they, it, it, it tastes fruity, it tastes like fruit. Citroën Mosaic. So, yeah, Citroën Mosaic. It's the two of the more obvious ones. Okay, well, it's just that the, the soil is still better for hops growing in Washington State and the Yakima Valley and in uh, the Marlboro parts of New Zealand. I mean, the, the stuff is fine. I mean, the, the Vermont stuff is fine, but I don't think they're going to, Vermont hops are going to replace those other two. No. I remember going to, out to, there was a guy who taught chemistry at UVM. Uh, I first was making beer and he lived out in what was then the kind of <laughs> distant part of South Burlington. And he had, and so I'd go out and get two five gallon totes of his water because I thought that, that was really important. Um, but then I, some brewer told me, the Burlington water is fine. And then if you're a real brewer, you can adjust that with all kinds of stuff that you add to get the, the pH that you want. So, you know, other than getting the, I mean, think about Budweiser. It's been uh, making beer in St. Louis for 150 years. Uh, so the treatment of the water is the real key. 
Um, and, um, but I used, I, I believed that at the beginning. I thought, oh God, you gotta have, God, it's really pure uh, country water, but no. What else? Mm. And we got my books. I mean, for goodness sake, come on. <laughs> Thank you.